increase Holy Ghost right now. Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see what you want us to see this morning. Holy Spirit, go from the left to the right to the center of the room. And I pray, Father, that you would nudge us into a new area of our life that you are calling us to this morning. So Holy Spirit, move right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome those who are watching online this morning as well. I want to say good morning to our online audience as well. Wherever you are watching, I pray that you would encounter Jesus in your living room, in your car, wherever that is this morning. I just want to say good morning and welcome and that Jesus loves you as well. Uh, this week, I don't know if you guys had a, had a week. Anyone just have those weeks? You just said, man, that was a week. Not W-E-A-K, just W-E-E-K. Uh, this was a week. Uh, from Sunday to Sunday, this was a week. This was a week. Um, just to be a little transparent with y'all this morning, wife and I and four kids were involved in a car wreck on, on Sunday or Monday night by a drunk driver. And uh, it was a week. It was a Monday. You ever say, hey, this was a case of the Mondays? That was a case of the Mondays. And, and I tell you what, this drunk driver hit us going about 60 to 65 miles per hour, according to what the police report is saying, and the four witnesses that were there. And I tell you what, we're on our way to our family dinner on a Monday night. Kids wanted Kirby Lane, and that's where we were going. They just wanted pancakes for dinner, and that's where we were going. And in an instant, in a suddenly, life got transformed for that moment. Not forever, but for a moment. And in a moment of just being able to talk to my wife and kids and laughing, the enemy strikes. And as suddenly, the enemy wants to come and strike your life, my life. He wants to try to turn your day upside down. But as, as she hit us, there was something inside of me that said, I said, God, why am I, I had to ask the Holy Spirit, why am I not mad right now? Why am I not angry? You had vehicles pulling over, cursing and cussing this young girl out, literally wanting to beat her because she almost ran families off the road miles behind us. We were the end result. We were the collateral damage. And I heard the Holy Spirit saying, there may be collateral damage in your life this morning that you had no business receiving, but it was because of people around you and situations around you that invited that, that brought that in and into your life. But in this moment, and I want to encourage somebody this morning over the next 30 minutes, as these people were cussing her out, coming to our defense, the first thing I could do and look at her and look in her eyes and in and, and, and a moment of where I thought I would be so mad, I looked at her and I said, hey, Brianna, I forgive you. The first thing that came out of my mouth was I forgive you. In a moment where she could have killed my four children, in an instant, she could have impacted a whole generation. I said, I forgive you. And I remember asking and walking away and seeing her get the DUI test and, and going through all the tests. And, and, and I sat there and I weeped for this young girl. I weeped. While people are still cussing her out, I had to calm the crowd down and say, guys, it's okay. We're going to be okay. I weeped over this 26-year-old woman because she looked lost she looked confused. She was obviously out of her mind, driving under the influence. A bad decision. But I heard the Lord saying, that's my daughter. And I love her, just like I love you. So this morning, I wanna give you the title of my message. It's joy and forgiveness and the freedom of letting go. The joy and forgiveness and the freedom of letting go. What does that look like to you and I this morning? I believe as I was praying for this this week, as I was feeling joy in the midst of a circumstance, yeah, upset, just property, God will replace the property. But the bigger thing at large, at hand here at church, are souls. Our souls. 
That's what I saw in this young girl. I saw a lost soul. This morning, I see lost souls out there. Yesterday, our church had the, the, the honor to serve our community. We got an outreach at, our, at the apartment complex right behind us. And I tell you what, heaven invaded that apartment complex. Heaven invaded the apartment complex. People were getting healed on walkers. People were giving their life to Jesus for the very first time. People were encountering a living, breathing Jesus. We met people at the well. We went to them. We didn't sit in the pews and warm the pews. We went to the people. Church, there are people that are dying right now. There's a church that needs to forgive right now because unforgiveness will hold you back to the destiny God is calling you to this morning. It is important possible to serve a living breathing king standing in unforgiveness this morning i'm getting riled up because when i should have felt angry and offended jesus says forgive her it's a lifestyle of forgiveness that we live so this morning as we approach fourth of july i heard the lord saying there's people that need to get free this week today you have been in captivity for far too long from that person, this person is harming, this person has wronged me, from saying, woe is me, God. I'm hearing that the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm freeing some people today. You've been in bondage for way too long. This is freedom week. Yes. I've been declaring in my prayers all week, God, people are about to get delivered today. In Jesus' name. Yes. Point number one, if you are taking notes this morning. The weight of unforgiveness. If you have your Bibles this morning, all right, let's, let's just take notes. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew 18, 21. I love this verse, Matthew 18, 21. As you're there, just let me know. Say amen if you are there already. I'm going to do some reading here for you this morning. Amen. We may not want to hear this message but it's needed. It's needed. The parable of the unforgiving debtor. I love parables because it's Jesus' way to communicate to us in a way that we would normally never see scripture. So before this, is, this is Peter talking to Jesus here and Jesus is just giving him a rundown of, of what the kingdom of God should look like. He's giving him a rundown of just correcting another unbeliever. He's talking about the, before this, he's talking about the lost sheep and, and God going after the, the lost sheep. And then before that, he's talking about who's the greatest in the kingdom of God. And, and in verse two, you don't got to turn there, but Jesus called, I'm going to start in verse two. I just jot this down, but we're going to go to 21. It says 18 two, Jesus called a little child and put him, put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of God. Why is he comparing in chat, verse two there, the kingdom of heaven, those who inherit the kingdom of God have childlike faith. It's the adults that screw it up. I'm gonna say it again. It's the adults that act like children. Think about that for a second. God is calling childlike faith. I got four kids, and when I see their faith, they got more faith than daddy. They're praying more bolder prayers than daddy. They're speaking in tongues. They're laying hands more so than daddy is. I'm not kidding. You guys want to come right along with us for a day? Come to Big Lots. Come to HEB with us. These are things that I don't tell you, but you are more than welcome to tag along with me and my family. These children have so much faith that they are going to people and telling them how much Jesus loves you. When us as adults, we are so afraid to tell the cashier Jesus loves you. Childlike faith is what I hear the Holy Spirit saying this morning. It's time to throw away the sin that hinders our walk with Jesus this morning. Amen. Our children are so pure. Our children are so, so righteous. As you look at your children, think about it as they were babies, as five and six-year-olds in your house. The joy that they had upon their life. They would look at you with innocence. They'd say, Daddy, Mommy, why can't we do that as adults? That's good. Abba, pride. That's right. Abba, Abba. That's to behold the Father. Daddy wants you to call out to him. Daddy. But 
but somewhere pride has got in the way. Somewhere we stopped acting like childlike faith, what God has called us to. Now we're the children. Now as adults, we're the children. Now we're the bickering ones. Now we're doing this. The Bible talks about in Isaiah, the Leviathan spirit that is entering churches. It is the spirit of pride. It's a sea creature. It's a creature that has many heads. And that's what pride does. It has many heads. And it says, one, I'm a churchy person over here, but two, I'm a prideful man, and nobody's going to tell me what to do. But church, Matthew 18, 2 tells me otherwise. You and I will not enter heaven if we stopped acting like children, but instead have childlike faith. He wants you to come sit on his knee and call him dad. I need you. As you scroll down to verse 21, then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And as, as Peter's here, I just kept seeing, like sometimes I look at it like a movie scene. I imagine Peter just, just having offense maybe towards somebody. He's just trying to get God to say, you know what, I'm gonna agree with you. You know what, that's what offense does. Yeah. Offense builds a case. I'm going to say that again. Offense builds a case. So as Peter sitting here, I just hope God says seven times. Oh, I hope he just says three times, just like the old Jewish rabbi tradition tells me that maybe he'll say three times. No. No. This is what offense does. It, 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 it negotiates with God. God, should I forgive him? He wronged me. Should I forgive this girl who just killed me and my family? No. So here we go. Let's read on. This gets good. You may not want to hear this, but this is going to be preached on today. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. I think we've all been in this situation. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him Hundreds? No, millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything that he owned to pay the debt. Imagine that for a second. That you were willing, that you had to give away your kids and all of this other stuff in your life because you owed a debt to somebody. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. That his master was filled with pity for him, and he released him and forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, here it goes. This is nobody in here today, I believe. I don't think it is. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. Here's a row, here's a rash of anger now coming up. He was just forgiven, but now here's a rash of anger coming up. After he was just forgiven, he's not gonna give it, but here it gets great. But when the man, like, he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. This was the man who was just forgiven. Now he's going to the guy who owes him money and he's shaking him, he grabs him by the throat. Now here we go. His fellow servant in the midst of this falls down before him, begged him for a little more time, be patient with me and I will pay it. He pleaded, but his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. Imagine that now. That is none of us in here, I believe, today. Who one hand says, Father, for forgive me, forgive me before our king, but then on the other hand, it says, I'm gonna grab you by your throat. In a matter of moments, we can have a Leviathan spirit from one side of the moment to the other side of the moment. That's none of us in here, I believe. When the other servants saw this, so there was witnesses, when the other servants saw this, they became upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven, that man who just had the man by his throat. He just forgiven, the, the, the king just forgiven this man. He calls him back in and the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, 
I forgave you that tremendous debt. It wasn't a hundred dollars. It was millions of dollars because you pleaded with me. That sounds like us sometimes. Father, forgive me, but I won't forgive anybody else. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant? Just as I had mercy on you, he's asking him a question. Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he paid his entire debt. Verse 35, that's why my heavenly father will do to you. There we go. I want you to highlight this. Circle it, mark it, everything you can do. That's why my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. <laughs> Powerful. But sometimes we could be like the man who had a million dollars in debt. And then we could forget instantaneously of the forgiveness that we had received. And just the very next moment, the very next day, we become the judge. Instead of letting the king be the judge. Our role is to love. Love. So Matthew 18, 21 through 35, I want you to study that. I want you to get that in your soul. I want you to, to get that rooted so far deep that this becomes your DNA. And as that happens, I want to give you a brief illustration that the Holy Ghost woke me up with the other night. I have a backpack here. Brother Doug, thank you for this backpack. You got it for my birthday. I love this backpack. I travel with it. I do everything with it. I'm taking it to Florida, Doug, so thank you. Uh, I looked at sin this way. I looked at unforgiveness this way. I have a backpack on my back, okay? I'm not gonna tell you how many pounds are in there right now. It's heavy, very heavy. Even as I'm talking to you right now, thank God I have strong soccer legs, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> used to, but this is what unforgiveness does. I can't run right now, impossible, impossible. But I tell you what, when I put this bag down, choosing to not forgive. I'm sitting in my office, my car. I'm worn out, God. I'm tired. But guess what? I'm going to choose one more day. Another hour to keep walking and walking. One day becomes 10 years. 10 years becomes 11. God, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. God, I can't keep calm. This is how we're walking around. That's how we're walking around. We're choosing to neglect commandments and we're partnering with the devil and we're saying, God, I, you told me that I'm supposed to have endurance, but God, I'm tired. Why don't I have endurance, Father? Father. And then we start to say, I don't hear the voice of God anymore. I hear this all the time. I stopped hearing the voice of God. Because we're carrying weight around our lives that we have no reason to be carrying. And all we hear at the end of the day is, I'm tired. You know how many times I hear that. As a pastor, that's all I hear. The first thing usually is, I'm tired. But if we're going to play tick for tack, everybody's tired at some point. But church, I hear the Lord saying this this morning. It's time to throw it off. It's time to take it out. It's time to take sin out and say, God, I'm not partnering with sin anymore. I'm not partnering with unforgiveness anymore. God, I can run now, God. God, I'm light now, God. God, you say right now, Father God, since we are surrounded by a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance, 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 endurance to the race God has set before us, church. He didn't say this is just a sprint. He said there's an endurance for a marathon. You're going to get people that offend you. You're going to get 
people that come into your life that have just just hatred for you but guess what church the bible says that we must be quick to forgive now many times not seven times peter i wish it was seven times believe me the flesh wants it to be three times but the lord says 70 times seven times he's telling peter something so 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 rich here he's telling you and i something so rich here when that relationship gets bad when that marriage gets bad when that friendship shits gets bad. I tell you what, be quick to forgive. Don't let the sun go down where you are harboring unforgiveness because guess what? That does more hurt to you and to me when we live in a fence church. That's the devil's job. His job is to hinder your endurance from going forward. As a coach, as a soccer coach, I train my players to have endurance, to really make sure that they could play a full 120 minutes. It's 90, Pastor. Well, when a tournament comes, it's 120. So I tell you what, when you train your body, when you get into the Word of God, you're training your soul to say when that day comes, when that moment comes, I'm going to be quick to forgive, and I'm going to let go of every weight that has ever hindered me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I heard the Lord saying that this week. There is joy in unforgiveness. Pastor, you don't know what they did to me. They wronged me. Hey, two wrongs do not make a right, church. They said this about my mama, my daddy, my sister, my auntie, my uncle. Guess what? I don't care. Because my Bible says, listen, I care. But the Bible says, be quick to forgive. Be quick to forgive. There is no negotiating with Jesus. I feel like we could become like kids and say, well, but God, go read what he told Peter. Read it. Get into the word. It's clear as day. As a matter of fact, it's in red lettering there for you. Red lettering. Your unforgiveness not only affects you, but those around you. Not only affects you, but those around you. Unforgiveness of sin does this. Holding on to unforgiveness can be considered, it's really a sin because God commands us to forgive. It goes against really his commands and the example that he set for you and I. Think about that, church. Let it sink in. Galatians 5, 22, 23 says this. Unforgiveness can lead to bitterness, anger, and resentment, which are contrary to the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit as we know, are exactly what the opposite of unforgiveness is. So this morning, if you have any of that, bitterness, anger, resentment, which is contrary to the fruits of the Spirit, I pray that Holy Spirit would come right now and speak because it's His gentleness and His kindness that leads us to repentance. Psalm 32, verse 1 through 2 says, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. Mm. We were so far from God, you and I at one point, that we begged for his mercy, just like this man who owed millions of dollars. But our souls were on the way to hell one day. And I want to encourage somebody this day. That your sin, I'm not saying this, but your sin can hinder you, will hinder your walk with Christ. And it could hinder. I would not want to die with any unforgiveness in my heart. I wouldn't. And I have to check myself every single day to make sure there is nothing there that says God, that is just screaming from the inside. I think the best indicator is even right now as I'm speaking, Holy Spirit, show me somebody. If there's somebody there that I need to forgive today, let me move on and not go back to that. Unforgiveness will be a heavy burden that steals your joy. This is freedom week, church. This is a week of freedom. I want you to declare that over your house. Start declaring this week is a freedom week. Not because it's 4th of July. We are so thankful for what we live in America. We're so thankful for for our freedom. But spiritually, prophetically, this is your freedom week. 
This is saying, you know what, devil, you have no room in my household anymore. There will be no gossip. There will be no slander. There will be no offense allowed in this home. And I start anointing every door, every window, and say, Father God, in Jesus' name, this house will be a house of glory that glorifies you, that encounters you in every single room. You start going through every single room in your home. I don't care where you live. And you just start anointing your home with oil and start saying, Father, in Jesus' name, this house is blessed. This is a house that edifies you. This is a house that exalts you. This is a house that worships you. This is a house that goes into your presence every single day. Because if you don't do that, devil is taking territory and you are giving him the keys now into your home. Is there dysfunction in your home? Well, maybe we need to get on our knees as, as married couples and say, Father, why are me and my wife battling so hard? Is there, is there something going on that we need to break and pray off right now? My wife and I always come together weekly. We do rundowns. We do checks to say, how's the vision of our household? How does it look right now? How, does our, how, does our, how, how, do, how are our children acting? And we come and we start declaring over them, pleading the blood of Jesus over them, pleading it over our marriage. Married couples, the devil wants to steal your marriage. He wants to come and steal your marriage. But he's not going to do that. Point number two, if you're taking notes. Love y'all. The power of forgiveness. Max Lucado, love this guy, said this. Forgiveness is unlocking the door to set someone free. And here we go. And realizing... You are the prisoner. Forgiveness is unlocking the door to set someone free and realizing you and I were the prisoner. Think about that for a second. Our spirit of unforgiveness locks you and I in a prison. But what does forgiveness do? It unlocks the door to set somebody free. Think about that. Colossians 3.13 says, make allowance for each other's faults. No one's going to be perfect. This is me. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Are we acting like children? Are we acting like children? The Bible tells me that people are, are what? Going to be perfect? Far from it. People are going to be far from perfect. Are people going to have faults? Absolutely. Does Jesus forgive us when we were at our worst? Absolutely. Should we forgive others around us when they are at their worst? Absolutely. Remember, Peter tried to negotiate. Jesus knocked him straight. It wasn't about a number. It's not about a number how many times we should forgive but it's about a lifestyle, an infinite lifestyle of complete forgiveness. It's saying, God, I don't care if they did me wrong. They did you wrong, Jesus, more than wrong than they would ever do me. Yes. But it's living and breathing that forgiving lifestyle that says, I'm not going to let offense come up. I'm not going to let it rise up in me. Right. So what does it do? What does the power of forgiveness do? It brings spiritual healing and reconciliation. Spiritual healing and reconciliation. First, it does one thing. It restores your relationship with Jesus Christ. It restores your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's essential. I'm going to say it again. It's essential for restoring our relationship with God. So this morning as you're sitting here, Father, I need to let go today. It is essential just like they said, liquor stores were essential during COVID. Uh-uh. The church is essential. And if we're not preaching the truth in the church of forgiveness, then we are just tickling your ears this morning as pastors, as leaders. But it's essential that you forgive who it is right now. Right now. Right now. It will also do what? It will foster reconciliation with others around you. Hmm. It starts paving the way through for breakthroughs in your life. Forgiveness will pave the way for breakthroughs. You can say, I have not had a breakthrough in this long. Is there any unforgiveness in your heart? 
Check it. That would be the first question that I ask anybody. I'm not hearing from the Lord right now. Have you forgiven lately? That's good. Have you forgiven lately? It will give you emotional and mental freedom. Emotional and mental freedom. It does this. It releases the burden of anger and bitterness. Did you know that unforgiveness physically takes a toll on your body? Not going to lie, I was stressing out Monday night when I got hit. A million calls I have to call everyone, insurance agent, adjusters, investigators in on this, police department, I mean, you name it. I've been on the phone all week. Has it brought stress? Absolutely. But I count it and I sit there with the Lord and say, Father, we're all going to go through that. But I can imagine if I didn't forgive this young girl who's lost and broken right now. You say, how do you forgive somebody who almost killed you possibly? Easy. Because Jesus says, Father, Father, forgive them for they not know what they do. People are in your circles and your workplace that say things because they just don't know. They just don't know. And our job as Christians, as you and I, are called to be the salt and the light to these souls. Because your forgiveness of somebody could also be someone else's breakthrough. And let's stop taking, let's stop being stressed and worried and anxious and losing sleep over this person who may not even be thinking about you. Quick to forgive. Forgiveness has the power to break chains and set you and I free this morning. When we forgive, we're not only setting others free, but also releasing ourselves into a place of joy and freedom. Joy and freedom. How many of you felt like you don't have that right now? Not with a show of hands, but internally. You say, God, why don't I have joy and freedom this morning? Do you wake up every day saying, I don't have joy? Is it fabricated joy? Is it because something brings you joy? There is no greater joy, no greater high, no greater uh, uh, state of drunkenness than being drunk in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say it again. If you are getting drunk on something else, be careful. Be careful. If you are getting high on something else, be careful. I will love you to Jesus. I won't play Holy Spirit, but I will love you to Jesus. I won't condemn. I won't say who you are. I'm going to call you as prophetically of who you will be. Is there joy and freedom in your life this morning? I heard the Lord say this. As you forgive, the chains that have held you captive will be broken in Christ Jesus. And I heard the Lord say, let the power of God flow through you as you release forgiveness this morning. And watch as freedom and joy will flood your life. You need to start declaring in your house, in your car, saying, I'm free. I'm free. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Are we shouting that every day, church? God, I'm free. From the chains that once bound you to now, God, I am free. Here are the steps to forgive. I want to give you, say, well, how, how do I forgive? Well, here you go. Confess your own sins. Reflect on 1 John 19. Confess any sins or grudges that you hold this morning. And accept God's forgiveness for your own feelings. Number two, pray for the offender. Pray for the person who hurts you. All week I've been praying for this young lady, asking God to encounter in her jail cell, praying for her family, asking God to bless her family and bless her. I've been empathizing with her since the scene of the accident. I empathize and I put myself in her shoes. And when you have a place of hurt, you try to hurt people. Rick Warren said it best. Hurt people will always hurt people. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it goes. So if we do not know how to empathize with people, it's going to be hard to forgive. And start speaking forgiveness. Verbally declare your forgiveness. Speak it out loud. Whether to the person or, or, or in the prayer to Holy Spirit. Point number five, within this point, act of forgiveness. Show kindness to the offender when possible. And I'm not saying this. 
I denounce any kind of molestation. I'm going to say this loud. I denounce any kind of molestation, any kind of rape, any kind of pedophilia, any kind. I'm going to say it loud because sometimes we're afraid to speak this in church. I denounce any kind of man who puts his hand on a woman, on a child. I denounce it and I speak against that right now. No way or form do I ever condone a leader, a pastor, or anybody else touching a child. Ever. And I'm not saying you have to go to this offender and say, hey, well, well, I forgive you. No, it's just a matter of getting in your prayer closet and saying, God, I just forgive this person and I'm going to release them to you this morning. Yeah. It's yours. God, I'm not going to live with the hindrance of weight of unforgiveness anymore. You've been in an abusive relationship. I'm so sorry. But God will forgive. He will. If you have not forgiven yourself, you are not the wrong person. You were never the wrong. And I promise you today, if you choose in an instant, God, I forgive that person who laid hands on my son, my daughter, whoever it may be. I forgive them. Could be decades you've been carrying this around for years, for months. But I hear the Lord saying, it's a new season. It's a new day. Today we are choosing to forgive. Point number three. Forgiveness as a lifestyle. Forgiveness as a lifestyle. Ephesians 4, 26. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. God created day and night, right? Day to get work done, get busyness done, get our kids ready for bed. But I tell you what, if any of us are living outside of Ephesians 4.26, where we're letting anger control you, God will forgive your anger. God will help you get over that anger issue. God will set things straight in your life, I promise you, but it's just submitting and releasing everything to him. And when it comes to offense, had I let it set in overnight, two nights, that's when I start carrying that weight around for a year, two years, three years, four years. Instead of letting that backpack go and saying, God, I'm taking everything out because I'm ready to run again with you, God. Choosing grace over grudges is what Holy Spirit wants you to do. Choosing grace over grudges. But he wronged me. She wronged me. You have no idea. Church, they wronged Jesus first. They robbed him. He died a death that he had no reason dying for. A criminal death. They spit on our Savior. They kicked our Savior. They lashed out on our Savior. They beat our Savior. Guess what? The world is going to do the same thing to you and I. And the devil hates that you are in church today. The devil hates that you're watching today on online. The devil hates every single second of you serving Jesus. The devil hates what's going on in this city because revival is coming to Austin. Revival is coming to this church. The devil hates what is happening right now in the midst of this morning. Revival is coming to marriages and homes. Revival is coming to generations that you said, God, that's hopeless. No, God is restoring generations that have been prophesied over that said these men and women will be leaders in this city, in this church. God will bring and restore every minute, every hour, every date lost, every tear that you've ever cried, every moment that you've ever weeped, God will redeem the time that you poured in to him. God will redeem it, church. He's cleaning things up right now. God is cleaning his church up, not just this church, but God is cleaning the global church up right now. God is cleaning house right now for the pastors, for the leaders, for the individuals who do not need to be taking a pulpit. God is cleaning house. God will clean house. This is a house that needs to be honored, revered, and served in faithfully. 
This is a church that needs to be so honored that the moment we come into these doors, Father, this is your house. How can I serve your house? Not my agenda, but your agenda. His agenda is Mark 16, 15. It says, go into the world. Go into the world. Not stop and sit in the pews, but go into the world, church. That's the word of God for today, for this church. He did not come say, serve me. No, he says, I come to serve you. Church, serve me. No, the church should not be serving you. I need to be serving you. I need to be serving my sisters and brothers in Christ. That's my job. So church, get ready. Revival is coming to your house. Revival is coming to your children. Children, 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 children. You pray a lot for generations, Pastor, and talk a lot about generations. I do because I cover the generations in the blood of Jesus every single day. Because what you start today in your home, God will see through for two to three hundred more years. God, you talk a lot and prophesy about the future a lot. I do. You should come to my home. I prophesy all the time in my house. God, this will be Araya's house one day, and Brandon's house is over here. This, you, you, well, well, Pastor, you're going to leave. Yeah, that, the Bible tells me to leave things behind for them. So guess what? I'm going to do it because I want their children's children, children to be blessed. I want to honor what the Bible says. Yeah. It's time to get radical, church. It's time to get radical. Forgiveness isn't a one-time act. It's a lifestyle Make it a daily practice and watch the joy be restored. Well, Pastor, you were in an accident and she almost, yes, but I had joy in the midst of a storm. While people were cussing this young lady out, I had nothing but compassion for her. Do you have compassion for the offender who offended you? Make it a lifestyle. A few points to make it a lifestyle. Daily reflection. Practicing empathy. Keep short accounts. That's important. Keeping short accounts. Well, their credit's not good with me anymore. Whoa. Their credit's not good with you anymore. I just hear the Holy Spirit. I can imagine him saying, wait, their credit's not good with you anymore? Shame on us for keeping account, for keeping record. Just imagine if God kept record of everything that you did. He says what? I blot out your sin. I throw it away as far as the east is from the west. But you, Brandon, want to keep accounts? What? Now you're acting like the child, Brandon. No, I'm not, God. Peter, you're acting like the child. Well, no, I I, I thought I could just ask seven times forgiven. After that, he could be put to death. He already was put to death for the forgiveness of you. And for your offenders. For those who wronged you. Resolve it quickly. Don't let the sun go down. Pray and meditate on the word. Seek accountability on the word of God. And start to share your journey of forgiveness with others around you. Because those around you will be infected of your stories of forgiveness. Remember, it's not about your breakthrough, church. It's also about their breakthrough. Get ready. Last point here. Brother Daniel, can I have you come up and close me out? Anointed man of God. The joy of being forgiven. Psalm 103, verse 10 through 12. You want to note this down. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far as from the east as from the west. Church, what a joy. What a joy that he saved us from hell. He saved us when we didn't need, when we don't deserve it. He looks at you and I this morning. This why? That's what he did at the cross. He hung, took nails in his hand, in his feet, not for brother.
brothers and sisters to quarrel. Not to keep record. But to love. Because he loved you that much upon the cross this morning. That he was for, quick to forgive the moment you said, God, I need you just like that debtor who owed millions of dollars. God, I have millions of sins in my life. You have no idea. He says, that's okay. Come to me and I'll forgive that. God, but you don't know what I did last night. That's okay. I'm quick to forgive. God, you don't know how many people I've wronged in this life and still from and did this from. That's okay. That's why I hung for you. That's why. Hey, thank you for tuning in to the Capital City Church YouTube channel. We'd love for you to subscribe so that you know when we post new content. Make sure to leave us a comment and let us know what spoke to you today, where you're watching from, and what can we pray for you about. And if you'd like to support the ministry financially, you can click the Give button now and help us continue reaching people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.